To say that the world-famous author Daphne du Maurier was merely an acquaintance of fellow author Leo Wormsley would be something of an understatement, despite them being from very different backgrounds. Leo was from Robin Hood's Bay on the coast of Yorkshire's North Riding. He arrived in Foy, Cornwall in December 1930. This was about as far away as he could get from those he was fleeing. His girlfriend, Margaret, would join him as soon as he had found somewhere for them to live. Leo was already a published author, having written boys' adventure novels, a serious book about his exploits in flimsy aircraft in the Great War, and numerous short stories for the lucrative magazine industry. And he just so happened to end up in an area of Cornwall where other authors were frantically at work on their typewriters. OK, maybe not so frantic, but you get the drift. These included Kenneth Graham of Wind in the Willows fame, although he died shortly after Leo's arrival. Also, there was the Victorian novelist Sir Arthur Quiller Cooch and Daphne du Maurier. She was in her mid-twenties, Leo in his late thirties, and they must have recognised each other as kindred spirits in the literary sense. Daphne's first novel, The Loving Spirit, was first published in 1931. Over 50 years later, Margaret wrote that they saw Daphne every day. She would join them for cream teas and was particularly fond of Margaret's scone and homemade jam. The three of them would take walks together. It was, after all, a beautiful coastline. Furthermore, they had much in common, particularly their unconventional outlook. So, a close comradeship between the two women, but with Leo there was also the literary connection. It's only natural that the crossing of their paths would influence each other. They discussed one another's work, and Daphne called him a jolly fair critic, and the esteem and respect she showed for his writing is still in print for all to see. One example is his 1939 novel Love in the Sun, which he set in Cornwall, for which she wrote, will make other writers feel ashamed, it is a revelation in the art of writing and may be one of the pioneers of the new renaissance in the world of novels. Despite being many miles from his native Yorkshire coastline, he used the rugged beauty of Cornwall to inspire him and finally got down to writing about the Fisher characters he had left behind and the village that had rejected him. Three Fevers was published in 1932. Daphne also drew upon regional themes, and her descriptions, like Leo's, use vivid imagery to paint a sense of turmoil that is mirrored in their characters. So you see, both of these authors used the environment they were sharing to reinforce the emotional undercurrents. Before Daphne was able to lease the mansion of Menabilly, the Mandalay of her most famous book, she took a dilapidated miniature two-room cottage built at the edge of a cliff, with steps leading down to a cove, and asked Leo to make it habitable for her as a place to write when her husband was away on military duties. Handy bloke, that Leo. But wait for it. This was where she got the inspiration for Rebecca. When in 1935 Three Fevers was to be adapted to make J. Arthur Rank's first feature film, Leo took his wife and children back to Yorkshire. Yet his friendship with Daphne remained constant. But in 1943 his marriage faltered, his children gone with their mother. Daphne felt a great sadness, and her husband, known affectionately as Tommy, wrote to Leo, Whenever we pass the old hut up Pont, we always look with affection and happy memories on the time when you and the family were there. There was mention of Daphne buying the farm he and his wife had bought in Wales so he could continue living there. In June that same year, she wrote to Leo and ended it with... Poor dear Leo, I do feel so desperately sorry when I think of Pont and your happiness there. I want to howl. My fond love always, Daphne. Now that was quite a friendship. 